Hello all and welcome to another episode of Your One Black Friend. I am your hostess, Jolie, or you can call me Jo. I've just had a wonderful conversation with an individual about the contents of my book, what inspired the book, the background of me, the author. And it was one of those conversations where I had a couple of thoughts. The first thought was, gosh, I wish this conversation was actually being recorded right now because a lot of points were hit in the middle of the conversation that I thought like a lot of people will get a lot from what is being discussed. So the, all, I, all I could do, the best I could do was the inner recording in my mind. And I'm going to try to do that through this podcast, see what points came up that I can sort of share with you guys, because I thought that they were incredibly meaningful. The basis of what was discussed was, or is, or were, I guess, the tenets of the concepts discussed in So You're Living in a Simulation. I don't often meet people where when I'm having a conversation with them, they pretty much get where I'm coming from or understand very quickly what I mean. A lot of the times, and I'm sure you guys have had this as well, you meet with people, most people kind of just want to stay on the surface, right? And they just want to talk about, you know, small talk. I want to talk about the weather, sports, this, any other. And sometimes you meet people who are interested in philosophy, or sometimes you meet people who are interested in like uh, spirituality, but it's very rare that you meet people that have married the two and also have an open mind. And so when you start to conversate, something happens. It's just like the, the wavelengths kind of like literally in the middle of a conversation, you can almost feel that resonance kind of sink. And then all of a sudden you're on the same page. And then just knowing that the person that you're talking to understands you and understands where you're coming from and understands the things that you're talking about, establishing that foundational framework makes it so that the leap from that point is not a harder, it's not a hard leap. And what I mean by that is more ideas can now come from a structure where a foundation has been properly breached, right? Or has been established between two people connecting. And so in that conversation, I had some pretty good, cool insights that I came to um, while talking to them. And I was like, oh, I'm going to record the podcast inspired by this conversation. Um, and so here I am. I'm going to do my best to try to recall as much of the conversation as I possibly can. And the insights that came from the conversation to the point where like, hopefully it's beneficial to you as well. Certainly will be beneficial to me. I'm looking forward to re-listening to this podcast, or I should say revisiting this podcast for the, you know, the ideas really, the, just having them to see them mapped out, um, and recorded. So first things first, the conversation was, well, what inspired this book? This was the beginning of the conversation. What inspired this book? And I said to them, I said, listen, I could, I could give you the canned response, right? Well, I wrote this book because this, that, and the other. But before I say that, I first have to acknowledge that I'm not responsible for really writing anything. And what I mean by that, and what I mean by I, is my consciousness is not responsible for writing this book. Everything that will happen, that has happened, that may happen, all realities exist as probabilities right now, which means that I was always in this timeline anyway, Joe, Joe Lee was always going to write this book. Now, what I've done as the consciousness that is controlling the avatar Joe Lee is I have watched the story of how the avatar, the character Joe Lee came to write this book. She first must establish this foundational baseline that this is not something that I did. This was something that I have witnessed myself doing. I have visualized, I'm consciousness, I have experienced, I'm aware of the story. And so I set about to lay out the foundation. This is how Jolie got to this moment in space time where the book was authored and then written. And this was the, you know, this was the framework. Now, in the conversation I said, and I don't even know if I'm leaving bits out, I'm absolutely leaving bits out, but from at least in the stream of consciousness that is going to arise in, in this conversation of establishing how the book got written, I can just tell you as it comes, right? So I started out by basically explaining to them my experiences. I'm going to cliff notes version you, spare you guys. And maybe there will be another episode where I actually go into a deep dive of how the book came across or came to be. 
But I talked to this individual about when I was younger. So first, 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 my earliest memories was, was me as early, as soon as I could pick up a pencil and a pen, there's two things that I always did. First thing I always did was I would draw this, what I would call an eternal flower. And I call that now, but it was just my flower. It was Joe's flower. It started out with a circle and then it would be the petals. And then in between the petals, I would put another petal. And then in between those petals, I would put another petal until it expanded into this like ever expanding petal. And I would, um, flower rather. And you would, if you had my notes, you could look at my notes from grade school through high school, college, uni, whatever you call it, you would always find that ever expanding flower. Didn't know that it was an actual thing. It was just something as soon and as early as I could pick up a pencil and draw. That was my first sketch and I've done it my whole entire life so much so that even my daughter's bedroom in the home that we owned, um, I, on her back door, I wanted to paint something and her, I painted her bedroom pink, which she hated. Pink is not her favorite color. It's my favorite color, but I figure if I'm going to paint a whole room, I'm going to paint it my color. I love pink. Um, she had like her Mario posters and stuff like that, but it was definitely a pink room. Um, but I, on the back of her door, I painted the same eternal flower. It was just my thing. If it was like, if there's an icon, if anybody has an icon, that was my icon. And I'll come back to that. So remember the eternal flower. The other thing that I could do from as young as I could remember was I would always draw Victorian women and in England, I would always talk to my mom about England and I would always draw Victorian women, the big dresses, the long hair, that would be like my standard go-to drawing always. And then to talk about London, I would talk to my mom when I was like a child, like a young, young child, I would describe, I would draw like England. And I would talk to my mom about like brick buildings. I'd never been to England, at least at that time. In fact, the first time I'd ever gone to England was in 2018. <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever gone to England. But yet I was talking to my mom about England, a place I'd never been And my mom. I grew up in Nigeria those of you who don't know, but my mother, she'd gone to London loads to England, London specifically, but England loads, because like, that's just what, you know, Nigerians did, at least in her circle of friends or whatever I should say would be more accurate. That's just what they did. And so she would lots of trips to holidays to London and bring things back to Nigeria. So, but it was weird for her child who'd never been there to describe a place she'd never been to. And it wasn't that I was like overhearing conversations or anything like that. I didn't really spend a lot of time around my parents. Um, if you're Nigerian, you understand this. We like our parents didn't, well, I'm not, once again, it's not a blanket statement, but a lot of Nigerians, at least when I, when I was growing up, didn't really spend a lot of time interacting with their kids one-on-one. -on -one. They had nannies, they had housekeepers, maids, things like that. And then their parents just kind of did our own thing until we got old enough to get sent off to boarding school. And that's how you raise kids. <laughs> I'm sure things have probably changed now. I'm, and I'm not saying that's a bad way to raise kids either. It was normal for me, so it didn't bother me. Um, but I definitely didn't spend a lot of time listening to my parents. And when I did, they weren't speaking English. Like they spoke Igbo or Yoruba or whatever to their friends. Because I grew up in Lagos, Ikeja. Um, and like Lagos, Ikeja, that's Yoruba. So they had a lot of Yor Yoruba friends. And then my mom's Igbo, so she spoke a lot of Igbo. So even if she was talking to her friend, they weren't speaking like English and I didn't understand, I was raised on English. I mean, I understood Yoruba here and there, but not fluently, right? And not enough to like construct a whole narrative of a country I'd never been to and then explain it to my mom in that way. It actually freaked my mom out. I remember a lot. She would like kind of side eye me growing up and she would ask like, are you a witch? <laughs> Cause I did weird things. Another thing I would do, and like my dad and my uncle can like confirm this simultaneously, but for some weird reason, I kind of knew how to read French, never been to France. My uncle told me this story. He'd gotten a fax from Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and they speak French in that country. And I was in his office at the time, kind of playing around, I think after school or whatever. And the fax came in, nobody understood the fax because it was in French. And apparently I was like, oh, let me read that. And then I read the fax. Like I, I read the fax that was in French. I translated it into English. I was like, five or six at the time. And I think my dad, my like looking back, what he'd said was, well, we just assumed that maybe they taught you that in school. And I was like, oh, not to that point. Like I'm five, six years old, like in hindsight, it doesn't make any sense. I, I can understand that leap or whatever. Oh, maybe she just learned it in school. But I mean, 
I have a daughter when she was five and six, like she wasn't speaking or being able to translate forms, you know? So I was a very strange, very strange child. I can barely, I can understand some French now. Obviously I lost it over time as these sort of things happen. Um, but I never lost that affinity for England. And, um, and I think just going forward, I, I did end up studying a lot of French when I got to high school and, um, and university as well. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing or the bigger thing is that from childhood, I'd always drawn like Victorian, Georgian, Rococo, like European, like women in that, in that style. And in that period of time. And as I was talking to this individual, I realized, wait, I still do. It's like there was something in me that stuck in that time frame. Some some aspect of me, not all of me, right? But if you guys look at my paintings, you can go to jollyartist.com. A lot of it is still that classical art, that kind of fashion. You could see that there's my brain, because when I paint, I don't really think. I just sit and I kind of collect pieces of what overall I want like the face of the painting to look like overall. But for whatever reason, this particular theme, women, but in this sort of like style, classic medieval, well, some aren't medieval, but let's just go like Georgian, Rococo, Victorian, like that era. I've, I've always kind of gravitated towards that. I had somebody comment something um, on my art page. Then they were like, why are you pay- like, why are you continuously painting like European history? Like we have our own history. And it's like, I understand that we have our own history. But our history, one, as Africans, are not is not relegated to Africa. Like, do your research. Like, <laughs> yeah, we've been here. Two, this is not this is not like a statement. This is it's something in my mind that I'm for whatever reason this is what I'm doing, and I'm I'm creating these pieces primarily for myself. But it wasn't until this conversation that it clicked. Like, Joe, wait, you've been like ever since you could draw, you were drawing this, and now you're painting the same thing. There's some aspect of me that was stuck somewhere around the, let's say like 18th century and in like England and Europe specifically between like France and England. Cause I also like, I love like the Rococo, like Marie Antoinette kind of style. I just don't incorporate it too much into my paintings, which tells me that it would probably be maybe whatever it was that got stuck had to be after the Rococo period and more into, I think Georgian is after, after that. But that to me, especially if you go back and listen to all the episodes we've been talking about leading up to this episode, that to me tells me that on some level, something is remembering those moments. I can't tell you who I was. I can't say I was this and this and this person, but it's like a dream that sort of is in the back of your mind that you're remembering and there's your subconscious is doing things without you being conscious of it. I mean, hundreds of paintings later and years later, and I'm like, it's just now clicking like, wait, Joe, you've been doing this for a really long time. Something remembers and something is reminding you to go back to the eternal flower. The same thing growing up. I loved Asian food so much that my friends called me Asia in college. I loved it, right? I also loved like Bollywood movies growing up um, and like the songs specifically. I could listen. I used to be able to listen to them like all day. I, as I've as time has kind of marched on, I've moved away from that. But once again, these things tend to kind of happen. The closer you are to, I guess, the recurrence to reliving a life or, or reincarnation, Harvey, whichever category you want to talk, you know, say it is. I think in this particular episode, we're talking specifically about reincarnation, not recurrence. In the last episode, I did make the distinction between reincarnation and recurrence. So I think the closer, like when you're born, when you're younger, you're much closer in time to your past life. But I think as this new avatar that you exist in becomes more and more solidifies, then that aspect of yourself kind of fades away, almost like a dream, but it's still there. Bring back to the eternal flower. I'm going to tie that up for you. I remember one time I was like in an Indian restaurant and the music was playing and I guess I didn't realize that I was doing this, but I was like singing along and dancing and everything like that. As I was eating, I tend to dance when I'm eating 
especially after like a fast or something like that. It's just a happy dance. It's just like, oh, food, yeah, or whatever. At the end of dinner, I was just leaving. I was there with a friend, but as I was leaving, the manager, I guess they were watching me the whole time. They ran out with a CD for me and they gave that. I will never forget it. And it just, it's one of those, once again, it's energy exchange, right? It's not always like somebody has to say something to communicate. Sometimes you can feel something. And when I got that CD, it felt to me like they were, like they recognized on some level that I was like one of them or had been without them actually having to say it. Like that was a gift of like, you know, welcome, you know, welcome home. I see you, right? Um, was it, I see God in you. I see consciousness in you. Um, that to me, I will always kind of say, I will always stay with that. But to tie that in back to the flower, going through university, I remember sitting through, I think like an introduction to like psychology class. And they went through the, like the, the lists of all the different, um, psychologists, right? So you do, um, Adler, you do Freud, and then you do Young. These are the three fathers of, of modern psychology, right? And of all the three, for whatever reason, I naturally sort of gravitated to Carl Jung and his archetypes and things that, but I didn't realize at the time, at least at university, because I was like half awake still, um, that Jung's psychology was also sort of born out of like the subconscious, the esoteric and influenced and inspired by the East, by India, right? Um, But that's once again, sort of growing, you realize this stuff. I recently, I think like the last couple of years or so, I decided out of the blue, I was like, I'm going to read or reread maybe. No, it was the first time reading. I decided I was going to read a book about Carl Jung. And I'm listening to this like lecture, this discussion about Carl Jung. And in the book, it's mentioned, and it's a, when I say read, I consider listening to an audio book reading FYI, for those of you who are new to the channel, it's the same thing because when you read, there's a voice in your head. That's like reading it to you. That's how you read. So I'd rather just have a machine re- like read it to me, but faster so I can get the information. I literally cannot focus on a, on, on a book at regular speed. It needs to be fast for my brain to actually pay attention. Um, but that's besides the point I was listening to this book and it kept talking about Carl Jung's mandalas, Carl Jung's mandalas. And I was like, oh. Mandalas. I'm going to go look it up. So I went online and typed in Carl Jung's Mandela and there it was my eternal flower. I didn't realize that my whole life from childhood to now, I was consistently, whenever I would doodle, whenever I was unconscious, whenever my mind would wander, my hand was doing its own thing, but it was drawing this eternal mandala. The mandala has its ties to the lotus flower, which is more or less a symbol of eternal life. As you guys have noticed, <laughs> I sort of have an obsession with the fact that we live forever with like with this, with everything sort of being like an extension. I also want to break down what the mandala means and what it has meant and what Joe's mandala, what it means to me. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys several definitions of mandala. First is ChatGPT's definition. When you type in what is a mandala, this is what I get. A mandala is a geometric, symbolic representation of the universe in Hinduism and Buddhism. It usually consists of a central point surrounded by intricate patterns and shapes, often arranged in a circular form. Mandalas are used for meditation, contemplation, and spiritual practices to aid in focusing in the mind and achieving a sense of harmony and balance. They can also be found in various cultures and artistic contexts beyond their traditional religious significance. All right, so that's one definition of mandala. Now, this comes up when you do sort of a Google search, just different things that kind of come up really quickly. Mandalas are Buddhist devotional images, often deemed a diagram or symbol of an ideal universe. Mandalas come in many forms. Often they are painted on scrolls and taken with travelers over long distances across the Eurasian continent. See, what I love about that definition of like, they're taken with travelers is makes me feel like consciousness is a traveler. And when you jump, if you do reincarnate, when you do reincarnate from let's say the 1700s to the present time, that is a journey. Right. And to me, I would like to think that there's on some level, some version of me was drawing that same mandala 
on whatever piece of paper I could find as something that sort of was taking it through my journey, so to speak, this particular journey, right? There's another one, another definition. A mandala, which is Sanskrit for circle or discoid object, is a geometric design that holds a great deal of symbolism in Hindu and Buddhism, right? Another definition, a mandala generally represents a spiritual journey, starting from outside to the inner core, through layers, All right? So that's another definition. Um, mandala is an object of meditation to aid in one's spiritual development. So. All my life, I was always drawing this thing. Now, what does a girl from Nigeria raised by Christian parents and a pastor as a father know about a mandala? It, it didn't even look like something that I could go, oh, that's out. It was, it, it took that book for me to go and go, wait, that's a mandala. And I'm going to post a picture of it, um, right there. Looked like just my flower. There's something that I did until I came across the young and his sketches and I realized that that was, that was it, that this is what I've been drawing my whole. So once again, what does a child from West Africa with no experience to Eastern theosophy or mysticism, why would I be drawing that? Unless on some level, there was a part of me that remembered another incarnation where that was a part of my culture. Another bit of the conversation that came up was how did I become sort of interested in theoretical physics and quantum physics? And my response, very short to condense it, was something to the effect of, well, it was a journey, right? I won't bore you guys with the detail, but long story short, it was I had some experiences with loss. So the loss of my little sister. Um, and I lost her when I was 10 and she was five. And so it was a very young age to have to face death of somebody close to you that you felt responsible for. And I blamed myself for, because I felt responsible for, um, there's more to that. It just was like survivors, survivor's guilt for years that I had, like, it just, I didn't talk to anybody about it, but I internalized her loss. Um, but another part of me was like, how can somebody be here today and then gone forever? I couldn't accept that. And then literally three years later, I had, um, I was supposed to be a twin and didn't work out that way. I ended up just being born. Uh, my twin didn't make it except that she was like, this is wild, but she was still part of me. Like she was still in me. And so when I hit like 13, she started growing again and very rapidly. So it became a tumor, but within me. So I appeared to be pregnant with my own sibling. And so they had to remove the tumor and, um, I lost one of my ovaries and I also had to have, um, chemotherapy, but it was a malpractice. So they never biopsied it. So to this day, never knew whether or not it was uh, benign or malignant, but I definitely had to have chemo for it. So I lost my hair, all of that. And, um, so there's a lot to have to go through as a 13 year old child. Um, so in a very short amount of time, I dealt with the death of my little sister. And then in some weird twist of faith, my other sister who was supposed to be my twin sort of almost brought about my own mortality. Can't make this shit up, right? So it's a very short amount of time where it's like my sister and then my sister, right? My sister that was born, but then she died. And then a sister that was unborn, but then was trying to like sort of be born through me, but in like a weird distorted sort of way where it would have caused my death. It caused me a great amount of pain and suffering. Um, but it also was a moment of self-realization. It was like something else that woke me up. Um, these are things that just came up in the conversation, right? When you answer a question like that in a way where you're not just sort of giving this like like I said, a canned response. Well, this is why I wrote it, but you really want to acknowledge that there are things that happen. Your life is a series of cause and effect, causes and effects, right? If you could sit and then really analyze the entire broad picture, you start to also in that analysis, learn a lot about yourself. So that the symbolism there is just wild. And I've not really deeped it enough, honestly, because I just hopped on to record to really, really understand it. Um, but it's there. And I will come back to revisit this. And then I think as I'm re-listening to this episode, it will, you know, more stuff will present itself to me. But I had to deal with death and dying 
simultaneously. And so as a result, um, I sort of wanted to understand, first of all, the mind and also religion. So those are the things that I studied at university. Psychology was my major. I minored in religious studies as well. Um, but primarily psychology, but psychology like sort of led to an interest in philosophy, which then led to an interest in Eastern philosophy. And simultaneously, this sort of undercurrent, um, when you study philosophy, Eastern philosophy, even Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, which I also was exposed to at a very young age, I grew up reading like the Iliad. <laughs> like I, I loved Greek like theology, like Greek mythology. Um, but I also grew up reading the Bible as well. Like I just, I love those stories. For those of you who read, so you're living in a simulation, you see that there's some references there. Um, but these are all sort of fragments that kind of have come together to form a book like So You're Living in a Simulation, but other like bits uh, applied as well. Um, playing video games. I grew up with a, with a Nintendo. Like that was the first video game I ever played was Mario Brothers and then a Super Nintendo. And then we had an Atari, we had the Game Boy. And like said so that when you're born at a particular moment in time, like all of that stuff was just coming, like was just coming out, right? And I remember playing The Sims and watching my Sim play a computer game. And as I'm watching my Sim playing a computer game, I'm playing a computer game. I sort of had this weird out of body experience as a teenager going like, wait, what if somebody is playing me, right? Um, same thing when I would like have my Sim paint, I'm watching the Sim paint and I'm going like, wait, I kind of, like those paintings, my Sim isn't really actually painting that painting, right? It's programmed in the game. And then when I started painting, I kind of felt the same way, especially after reading all the stuff that I ended up reading, right? Like, am I really painting these paintings or are they just embedded in the game? And now I would be able to answer based on everything that I've read that, yeah, I'm not really the one painting the painting. They're just embedded in the game. But I couldn't tell you which came first. I couldn't tell you if psychology led to self-help books and then self-help books led to like philosophy and then philosophy also led to like, okay, I'm going to, you know, read more books on physics because like in, you know, philosophy, especially Eastern philosophy, you sort of start to hear things that you have heard echoed in theoretical physics or if it was just all happening at the same time. But at a certain point, I kind of just got hyper obsessed with learning as much as possible about the nature of our reality. So 600 books and counting on Audible that have been in my head that I've just practically like consumed over the span of about six years or so is what brought and has brought the content that you see now. And as some of you might be going, how did you consume so many books in that amount of time? Well, I listen. So I've been saying I listen to audiobooks and I've trained my mind because I have issues with focus. Your weakness is your strength. So I've trained my mind to listen to books at sometimes 3x, sometimes 3.5x speed with headphones. And so it allows me to go through a book in a very quick and a very short amount of time, but also re-listen to the same book over and over again until it becomes a part of my mind. I have likened it to training my mind right, on, on a data set, the same way one would train AI, what AI is sort of mimicking us and vice versa. So do with that information what you will. I would recommend the same thing. You don't have to, you're not jumping to 3x, right? Like I said, it took me years to get to where I am now, but my mind, every time you read a book, every time you listen to a book, your mind changes and it's almost like you're crafting this new mind, right, from the one that you've given. You become a fundamentally different person than you were before you read that book. Most people don't read. And I've said this before, if you can't read or you don't read, there really isn't much of a difference, All right? Each book is a lifetime of experiences by the author. And in just a few hours, you can consume into your mind a whole life in just a few hours in your mind. So every book you read is somebody's life that you are learning all of their life lessons. You're learning in just a few hours. If you're doing that, even if you just listen to four books a month, right? It's almost 50 books a year. 
That's 50 minds in one year in your one mind. You don't think that makes you like a fundamentally different person at the end of the year than you were at the beginning? Try it. Anyway, so as the conversation went on, like more and more, you know, things sort of like unraveled. Um, and I, I, I mean, it was a very un- enjoyable conversation because once again, when you're talking to somebody who understands where you're coming from and they seem genuinely interested in hearing how you got to your point, things kind of just come up just because there's not this, like this happens. We talk about this in telegram group, um, where you kind of just feel out of sorts, you know, like just out trying to exist with most people. <laughs> right. Um, so when you meet somebody that's like you, that's like-minded, you, there's just a certain level of like, re, like you just get relaxed. You're not tense. Cause you know that the person that you're talking to isn't going to judge you. And so if that's gone, then you can really talk about anything. Because there's no voice in your head that's like blocking you from communicating. And that's what happened. So the discussion led to, okay, so that was what led me to Eastern philosophy. And for those of you who don't know, Eastern philosophy and quantum physics parallel each other. In fact, a lot of quantum physicists and theoretical physicists have found themselves looking for, talking about, discussing a lot of stuff that was written in the East thousands of years ago. So that is something worth noting. They eventually sort of overlap themselves. And then that, of course, coupled with just growing up, you know, in the culture that we found ourselves in and being a super nerd about sci-fi, right? I grew up on sci-fi, um, Star, Star Trek, Doctor Who, um, the sci-fi channel, basically whatever was on there. Any sort of movie, Total Recall from like, like Schwarzenegger's Total Recall. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like that's the stuff that I grew up on, like Superman, like all of that was just in my brain, right? Bill Nye and the science guy, like all of that. But I also loved the esoteric. So I loved like Angel and Charmed and Sabrina, the Teenage Witch and like all that kind of other stuff. Like it was kind of weird Gothic kid too. So like it was just all in there and that kind of brought about like you can't have all of these things happening and then not have a book like that. <laughs> like you're gonna, that's, it's like being a chicken and, and giving birth to like an egg. Like that's one book. There's gonna be other books, but that one book is like the egg. It's just one egg. There will be other books that drop, but it's from this mind that is like, all of these experiences and that's what gets sort of, you know, spit out. And of course the book is, you know, the videos, it's a transcript of the videos that were on TikTok, the kind of different ones that went viral or whatever. But then I built on them. I expanded on them. I was like, okay, this is the written word. Now we really got to take the time to explain these concepts. Some got reworked in ways that I couldn't explain for a general audience because most people wouldn't get it, you know, and I didn't have the time to. So that's how the book more or less came to be. But I said all of that to say that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, right? That's just a narrative, but the narrative, and well, I guess it's not fair to say it doesn't matter. It does matter, but it's a backstory. Yet at the end of it was that it was always going to be. I just told the story of how Jolie wrote a book, right? And if you were watching the movie of Jolie's life, or if you were watching the recording of Jolie's life, that's just what you saw. That's how you saw it. Like this, this, that, and the other. And then that's what brought this into existence. But it would always, it was always going to be. That was what it was. At least in this timeline, I was always going to write that book. I always wrote that book, at least in this timeline. Now we're going to go back to the mandala and what my mandala means to me, right? So my mandala started out with a circle. And like I said, the petals were like, it was like a circle and then petals, petals, petals. And then in between each petal, I would put another petal. And then in between those petals, I would put another, in between the tips of those petals were another petal. Lately, I've been thinking about why I kept painting that or drawing that. Why have I drawn that over and over again? And I think that the message that my higher self has been trying to communicate to me is what we've been talking about the last like four episodes plus, eternal recurrence, particularly this specific avatar. The circle is the, like, you know, the avatar, right? Always has been. And then each petal represents an iteration, right? This is one life. This is another variation. There's a variation where Jolie never writes the book. There's another variation where Jolie writes the book, doesn't publish it. There's a variation where she publishes it, but it, it was like through a publisher. And so it didn't, you know, it wasn't what she actually wanted to say. There's all of these things. And then between them, there's another there are more variations of that. Okay. Well, 
maybe she published it, but this was different or this was different, or she was based here, this, that, and the other. That's you. That's you, your avatar. There's this, that's the, that's the avatar. That's the character. It's a circle. There's no beginning or the end. When you look at a circle, it's a, it's a closed circle, no beginning, no end, just always been. And then each petal is an iteration. Each petal is a probability that exists right now contained in this sort of expanding hole to infinity or at least near infinity and beyond, sorry. <laughs> right? So that is what my mandala means to me. It's a remembrance, a memento. I don't want to say memento mori. Memento mori means remember that you're going to die. I've got to figure out how you would say it in Latin. Remember that you've lived many lives. Memento vivre or something like that. Remember that you've lived many lives. I gotta remember, I'm going to write that down. Remember that you've lived, sorry. Remember that you've lived and will live and you will continue to live over and over and over again, but different variations, different variants. Let's go back to the conversation. They had said something to the effect of, so you're saying that like, we are always going to have this conversation, which I did say that I said, yes. At this particular moment in space time, in this particular timeline, you and I always have this conversation. However, simultaneously, there are other timelines where you and I never have this conversation on today, or maybe we have this conversation on another day, or we just never like, communicate. We never, like, it's just, but they, like that eternal flower and they exist parallel to each other. Each petal exists parallel to each other. So are our lives. Now, I, the consciousness that is experiencing this reality and as this Jolie, this petal, I'll say that again, the character, I'm sorry, the consciousness that is experiencing this reality, this petal as Jolie. So the circle is Jolie, that's the avatar. Your circle is whatever your name is. And then the petal that you're in right now, that's just one one petal, that's just one life, right? But next to it, because it's a flower, are all these other Jolies sort of doing their own thing right now. But you're not Jolie. I mean, you're not Jolie. I'm not Jolie, <laughs> right? I'm a consciousness that's experiencing Jolie as this petal now, which means that there are other consciousness. You're not the character, you're the consciousness that's experiencing, who's experiencing or playing as Jolie. A really good way to put that is, so my very first theater experience I've ever had was, I went to go see Groundhog Day. I posted about it on my stories on Instagram. It was my first theater show ever. And I love the like universal symmetry of it because one, I didn't choose it. Uh, it was chosen by a friend. So a friend of mine took me there. I didn't even, I wasn't like, to me, the idea of I got to go see Groundhog's Day and the theaters, it didn't even sound like something that I would have done on my, like something I would choose to. I've never even seen the movie, to be perfectly honest. It just was serendipitous and of course the universe communicating. But I went and I watched and I love it. And I loved it. And I'd probably see it again. Um, but if the show gets picked up, let's say it reaches like world acclaim, then it won't only show in just that theater, right? It will show in theaters around the world. Like it will show in London, but it will show also in New York, right? On Broadway, it would show in San Diego, it will show in LA, whatever, right? Kind of like Wicked, right? Wicked is you don't have to go to just one, it, like it's everywhere. But the characters in the show are all the same characters, but it's different actors playing each character, each role. And if I went to go and I played in, you know, Groundhog's Day, I'm going to, I'm going to play that character differently than say you played or somebody else played the character, but the characters are all the same. The stories might also all be the same, right? More or less, but it's going to have a slightly different spin to it because there's different people playing it. It's a different consciousness playing it. That's where I'm getting at. But now let's pretend that this universe is not like exactly or strictly like a theater show. Let's pretend that this universe is kind of more of an AI generated show. 
right? In the sense of the overall theme, let's say like this universe is like a Groundhog's Day universe. It's like the overall theme of this guy's gonna live his same life over and over again. That's programmed in, but because it's AI generated and that's part of the experience, each iteration, each story, each play, each consciousness is playing is going to have variants. So I don't know how many of you use Mid Journey, but if you put in an image and it, um, it develops an image, you can now click to upscale the image and then you can tell it to create variants. And so it will create variations and you can either have it variate like very strongly or like weakly. That's your choice, but it's all, it will, it will do that. It's programmed. That's kind of the beauty of Mid Journey and how it operates. And I'm saying that the same thing occurs here. So in a quantum theater, right? Let's go back to the show, um, Groundhog Day. So imagine Groundhog Day, it's picked up, but now it's a quantum theater and the, they're using the framework is the same, but let's say if you go to a showing in a theater in New York, it's not exactly the same storyline, maybe in New York. And maybe if you see it on Wednesday, he actually breaks out of the loop at the wrong time. Like he's just killed a bunch of people. <laughs> Sorry, that's dark. He just killed a bunch of people. I have a dark sense of humor. And that's when the loop ends. And now he's got to go to jail and good luck explaining to everybody why you killed everybody, right? No, I'm, I thought that they were going to loop. We thought, which just made me realize that maybe people who we consider crazy aren't actually crazy. Maybe something's going on beyond what we actually like realize, right? Um, so that's that you see that on a Wednesday in New York and then say you want to go to see it on in London, right? But maybe like on the West, West side, right? You go and you see that in that show, in that iteration, um, it's not the, it's not a guy, right? It's, it's the lady that's looping her life, right? That would be like kind of a bigger variation. Um, but it's a variation that's a, that's a strong variation or it would be, all right, let me stick with there. So just for the sake of this like consistency, right? So it's still him, but he doesn't ever break out from the cycle. He's just stuck in the same cycle, but he's learned to, you know, love it. Or here, all the things that he does like are just different. He just does different things. But because the storylines are AI generated, there's more variation. There's more variance on what each story or how each story kind of plays out. And I'm saying that that's what's happening here. So different consciousness are playing as the person that you see when you look in a mirror, you're just the actor. Your consciousness is just the actor playing this particular role, but there are others, there are other yous, there are other Jill's or Frank's or, you know, Nina's or right across the multiverse, but it's not you because you're not your body. It's not you because you're not your body. It's your consciousness that is playing the role of all these different forms. Now, the question came up in the conversation. He, he brought it up and he was like, is it one, is there one blueprint? I love this question. Is there one base level Joe? Is there one Joe that all of these variants are sort of copies of? And my response to that is probably, I mean, they're for everything, like, even as I use the mid journey, um, image generator as an example for it to create variations, there has to be one sort of baseline core, you know, version. But to me, that doesn't really, doesn't really bother me too much. Right. Because it's like, we know that there's a blueprint. That's what your DNA is. And then as I was talking to them, I realized like, holy shit, like my twin, she would have been my twin that came up in the, like, in my mind, I was like, holy shit. Like speaking of blueprint. Yeah. Like. My, there was a blueprint. We have the same DNA. We had the same DNA. I kind of got generated, <laughs> generated and became the person that's talking to you right now, but her life path was different. Same DNA, but her life path was different. It became this sort of this weird like thing that still impacted my life, but in like a different way to set me up in this different path. But the blueprint was the same, right? Which means that, yeah, there is a baseline sort of like core level Jolie. Somebody made a joke. I deleted the comment because I was like, don't, don't do that. But it was on my, it was like on my Instagram channel and they're like, Joe, you cut your hair. They cloned Jolie. Nobody fucking cloned me. Fucking rude. And 
we're all clones then, like by that, by the definition, if you believe that there are parallel universes, if you believe that there is a blueprint of you, which is your DNA, and there's versions of you throughout the multiverse, then you're a fucking clone too. Like there's twins out there. Twins are natural clones or nature's clones. There's triplets and shit like that too. I just brood. I just really bothered me. That bothers me when people ask me, like, if they're like, you're, you're AI, like that, I shouldn't, I don't know why, <laughs> it's a weird thing to get upset about. Um, I think because it's just like, it's a really slippery slope. I'm smiling, but I'm actually being really serious. It's a very slippery slope to like you dehumanizing a whole human being. And it's really easy to do that when the person's on a screen, not in front of you. But like, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a human being. I'm just sharing my thoughts, my ideas with you. It's not easy to do. You know, so don't, you know, don't make it harder. Um, that said, I really am grateful for like 99% of people who don't say shit like that to me and are very encouraging and really enjoy the podcast and let me know that they enjoy the podcast and that they enjoy the book and things like that. So I'm, I'm 100% grateful um, to you guys. But to go back, I mean, I guess technically you could say that I am, you know, like a twin. And if, it's, if something's being copied, what's the baseline? Is there a baseline Jolie? And I responded also, I said, you know, there was a video I put out in February that somehow I think low key indirectly or maybe directly inspired the writers of Black Mirror because they put out an episode based on the same video. Like there were weird parallels, who knows? Um, episode was called, or the clip was called Meta Doubles or Meta Doubles, like doppelganger. So M-E-T-A as in like metaverse and then doppels, like D-O-P-P-E-Ls like doppelganger. Um, and I was basically, for those of you familiar with the video, here's a recap, um, or I don't know why I said that. Anyway, um, but I was basically saying like, you know, based on your data blueprint, right? All the stuff you put in on social media and Facebook, your clicks, your likes, like shit you said around your phone, it's all just being fed into some database somewhere or whatever, or several databases and some clouds where it's stored. Right now, somebody could literally generate a version of you that sounds like you, that looks like you using a blend of like deep fakes and AI generated like in chat GPT to create a clone of you. And then the end of the video was basically, how do you know that that's not already what's happening here? I'm not under any illusions. I've never been under any illusions that this me is the only me. In fact, if you go back to the Dark Oracle's Guide to the Multiverse, I basically talk about that. Like I basically say like, there's no, like you don't, this is not, you're not the only one. <laughs> so I'm, but I'm not attached to this. Like this is, I'm not identified with this form. So it doesn't matter, you know? That's why I do stuff like, okay, I'm gonna shave my hair now. Like, and it's growing up. Anyway, like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Cause I know the consciousness is controlling the form. It's like a car, right? If you get a Jeep, I've used, I use Jeep as the sort of analogy, um, but you get a Jeep and I get a Jeep. We're, we're gonna do different things to it because the, where the drivers are different. You might trick yours out and I might leave mine just like base level standard, right? The drivers are different. And then depending on how I treat my Jeep is gonna be how it's gonna operate, right? You might take care of your Jeep differently than I would, but the serial number is the same. Um, I'm sorry, the serial numbers are different, but for, for the most part, it's exactly the same. There's a baseline, right? But that's the same thing too. When you think about a Jeep, the very first like Jeep Wrangler, for example, right? Um, was there a prototype? Yes. But if you look at my Jeep now, it's pretty fucking awesome, right? I'm not going to post it because like, it's like, you'll know, I don't want people knowing that it's me or whatever, but it's a badass Jeep. Um, to say the least, right? My Jeep looks significantly cooler than the prototype, like the original OG Jeep. So I don't know if I give a fuck if I'm a copy of Jolie, cause I think this is actually like probably the coolest presentation <laughs> of Jolie. Like I'm colorful as shit. Like this is, this is fun Jolie, right? I bet the other Jolies are boring as shit. <laughs> This fun jelly. I, I get. I bet I'm the funnest version, right? Does the baseline matter? Does the prototype matter? If I'm a copy, right? And my brain just made a fucked up joke, right? It was like <laughs> my brain makes lots of fucked up jokes, but it was like, okay, well, one, my twin tried to kill me. Like Loki, she did. Do you guys notice that? Like, there's like twins. There's always like an evil one. Like, there's like always like a shady tr twin and like a really good twin that's just like nice for no reason. It's like it didn't mix properly. It just split into like two halves or whatever. And I always wonder like which one of us was supposed to be like the evil one. 
And I've talked to my husband about this. At first, he goes like, "Obviously, you're the evil one because like you like made it." So I don't know what happened when y'all were in the womb, but you fused into this one person. Um, but then I was like, "No, because I'm awesome and sweet and kind, like almost to a fault." But then I can get kind of vile. Um, but then I wonder if that's because now we're kind of technically one or whatever. And then I say also, but like she did low-key try to kill me when I was 13. So wouldn't that make her the evil twin? But I guess I don't feel a sense of loss because on some weird level, it's like we're still one. I don't know. Is it getting weird for you guys? I'm sorry. This is probably TMI, probably more that you needed to know. But there you are. Fun facts about Jolie. Does the prototype matter? Does the original matter? No, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you gotta take it back. Even go all the way back, the baseline human, the first human female. Have you seen what they said the first human female looked like? Lame. <laughs> Sorry. But I'm saying like they were, like the first like model of like a homo sapien sapien was like all hairy and shit. Like who cares if there's some baseline? They, they've done this actually with like, um, cats for example like when you clone a cat it could genetically have the same dna but that doesn't mean it's going to express it that dna is going to express in the same way you know what i mean like sometimes like just different things happen where the same baseline but there's different changes and so it's the expression of the dna that matters more it's not necessarily the blueprint i don't know if i predict i don't first of all i know i'm not the original joe lee or maybe i Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I'm the matrix. I'm the mother. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, I know I can't be the base level, but even if I am, like, I, I mean, well, sucks for the other ones. They, then that, no, actually, that probably means the other ones are like way cooler than me. I don't quite get cooler. Oh well, but more than likely, I'm not. I'm not the original. I'm not the OG. OG Jolie. Yeah, you know I mean, and you're not the OG. You know, John or you know, Adora or Lucy, who cares? It's what do you do with this? Like, are you going to custom? Are you going to pimp your avatar? <laughs> did I just say that? I did. And I'm going to write that down. Pimp your avatar. For those young'uns who don't know what that is, it was a show back in like the 90s or the 2000s fe featuring the actor exhibit. And he would like show up and get people's busted ass like hoopties and he would pimp their ride. Sorry, my daughter's probably watching this. I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> and it would just make like really cool versions of like old beat up cars. It would just like be cool. So you're like the pimped out version or you know what? Be the pimped out version of your present avatar. I think that's all that matters. Yeah. But you know what's very interesting? So at the end of the conversation, um, this individual, they said, um, gosh, this is very rewarding. And I honestly wanted to say that I'm just grateful for your existence because a lot of times people just aren't curious about life. Like they just don't seem to care and they want to keep things surface, which first of all, somebody saying to me, like, I'm grateful for your existence is just like amazing. Like, thank you. That was just a very incredibly sweet thing to say, you know, um, and kind. And just like, it's not even like an ego boost. It just kind of makes me feel like the things I do matter, you know? Um, and what I mean by that is like, okay, so we have a baseline, we have a body. That we're born in and you have a face and I could, you know, style my hair away. I can wear my makeup. I can present in a particular way. And that's fine. That's the outside. But the mind, in my opinion, is the most important thing to customize. And we can do that by the books that we read, you know, and, and the things that we expose ourselves to even music, right. And, and film even, because even media, movies, TV shows, like they can still change the mind, shape the mind. Your experiences can still shape it. And so that a beautiful mind, a unique mind is just as like exciting to me as a beautiful face. Like, as you guys can tell, I love beauty. Like I, I love beautiful faces. I, I just, I mean, who doesn't love beauty, right? It, there's something about beauty that, that quiets the internal monologue that, it, that arrests the mind. And which is why I like, I enjoy, and I consistently paint beautiful faces. We've established why I consistently paint people in a particular time period, because on some level I'm stuck there or trying to remind myself that there's bits of you that come through into your, you know, present incarnations as well. Like it, it doesn't get wiped. You may not mem remember here, 
but it doesn't get wiped. There's different kinds of memories. Pay attention to heart memory. I said this in, in the last episode. So please check it out if you haven't yet. There's memory here. There's recognition here. This isn't the only thing. This isn't the only thing. The brain is not the only thing. There's feeling, there's consciousness. You just, there's sometimes there's just intuition. There's knowing, there's other types of memory, you know? But face isn't, you know, the only thing that can be beautiful. There are people out there with finely curated, highly curated, perfectly curated minds that over time they've like shaped and molded, you know? And when you come across those kind of people, it's just like, ah, I, I just, can I just, can I be in your life forever? <laughs> like, I know, I know we can't control these things and, you know, fate has other things in, in store for us. But, you know, if I, if you're not meant to be in my life, that's fine. I appreciate you just for just existing. And so to have somebody say that, you know, that just was like amazing. That was awesome. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but what he said was, you know, there's so many people out there that are just kind of stuck in just the surface level of things. And I was like, honestly, until you said that, I would have agreed with you wholeheartedly because it has been very frustrating for the most part, you know, trying to connect with people that get you. I'm grateful for the podcast because the podcast and the, you know, my Instagram and TikTok has allowed me to connect with more people that think like us really. Right. So that I'm grateful for, but that's online. Like in real life, it's not as easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you, it, you do, it's a bit of isolation in a way, but as he was saying that th- I had this thought in my head, like mm, flowers. And so I was like, I just want to share, this is like a feeling that came. I said, you know, under normal circumstances, I would agree with you, you know, about just that fresh, I would share that frustration. And I do share that frustration with when you look around and you see like most people are just like not really trying to like have deep conversations and really think deeply about the nature of our reality. But I just had this like flash of like insight, like a visual sort of memory, I guess, if you will, of flowers and this thought, it said, not everyone can be flowers. And I said, you know, some some minds are just flowers, you know, like there, there's a lot of foliage out there. There's a lot of, you know, greenery. There's a lot of leaves out there. There's a lot of trees. There's a lot of bushes even, but there's not a lot, you know, as many flowers. And so I think for us, you and I, yes, my hands aren't this big, by the way, it's a distortion. Anyway, <laughs> I think, um, as you see, so there's another, okay. Anyway, there are flowers. We are the flowers. If you look across the world as a a great, you know, sort of forest, right? You'll see that here and there, they're just, there's flowers. That's all. You know, there's nothing wrong with the bushes and the trees, you know? So long as the trees don't make you feel like shit for being a flower. And maybe that's just more envy than anything else. But there's something beautiful about a flower and those are more rare. And that insight kind of helped me go, okay, like it's all right. You know, everybody's going to get me, but there are other flowers out there. I'm not the only one. Obviously you guys are flowers as well. If you listen all the way through, like you're clearly a flower as well. Um, so yeah, that was, I'm sure there's stuff that I forgot. Um, but this is as much as I'm going to remember. I'm actually like, I'm fasting. You can see, you can see me dropping energy dropper. I'm fasting. So I'm going to break my fast at four. It's three forty six right now. So you just, my energy is depleting. I'm, I'm running on just pure hype right now. Just excitement about sort of the insights that I gained from this conversation. Um, and just excited to share it with you guys and what it, you know, hopefully it means something to you, these experiences. Um, but next time I look at a flower, I'm going to remember like all of these other sort of cells that are out there. Um, but on a final note, do you understand? Do you understand that this ties into the episode I did on regret? All those petals in the mandala, while there are other consciousness sort of playing the roles of these petals, understand that this multiverse is complex, right? Your consciousness can also play as all of these other petals. It's there. We are a fragmented consciousness. We are a fragmented mind, if you will. So I could play, and that's where the eternal recurrence also kind of comes back into play. I could play 
as Jolie in this timeline, but I'm not restricted because consciousness is not restricted to this form, right? So just as all these other consciousness, all these other actors are, you know, playing different variations of Jolie, I can also go and play, you know, this iteration, this iteration, this iteration. So that mandala, not only does it apply to like others as well, that mandala could also, in my opinion, also applies to me. And I think that's the second message to myself in the sense of have no regrets. You are the circle. All these petals exist as part of you, Jolie, this experience. Have no regrets because this is the path that you're in right now, but you've, you've played this path. You've also experienced this path. This is why you have deja vu. You've also experienced this path. And so if you didn't take a path, there's no sense in re like regretting it because then you're at the end, you're going to have a choice or a chance to come in and play this path or this pedal or this pedal, this pedal, this pedal, that at infinity it's there, right? It's almost like saying to kind of bring it to this reality. It's like saying, okay, if you are an actor, you know, on Broadway playing wicked, you know, you could also go and play in London, that same role that you played, right? Like it, there's nothing stopping you from doing that except maybe a work visa, but you can get a work visa, right? So it, it's also applies. So just as that same character can play that same role every single day on Broadway, that same actor, right? Can also go to different theaters and play that same role. But then that same actor can also go and play in different roles as well. Recurrence and reincarnation all happen. Oh, and I, I think we had a conversation towards the end of the conversation. We talked about entropy and we talked about what, well, what sort of entity entities, well, actually no backtrack. So the conversation ended something to this effect. It was, where does it all begin was what they asked. And my, my response was, I don't have a problem with the beginning. My response is, where does it all end? That's where I get stuck. And by suck, it's like my brain doesn't like it because to go back to the blueprint, if there is a blueprint baseline Jolie, right? You could make the argument that that's the real Jolie, which I, I don't think that implicitly means anything, right? If I make, if I do a painting of myself and then I offer prints, yes, that one copy, like the original painting is a painting of me, but that's just a representation of Joe. That's not the real me, it's just a copy. So just because there's one original painting doesn't mean that that painting is me. It's the same thing, just because there's one baseline Joe Lee, that doesn't mean that I'm Joe Lee, right? And doesn't mean that Joe Lee is real, right? Because that's where my brain goes in. Like, where does it, how do you know that that one, the blueprint is the real version? Cause how do you know, like if there's, if I'm, if this avatar is crafted on a real Jolie in the real world, how do you know that that real world is real? There's gotta be a world, like how, where does it stop? And so the only thing, and this is my response to, to them was the only thing that makes sense to me. And you guys have heard me say this before is that all of this has to be some sort of like breathing of some creature that we can't quite fathom unless you stop thinking and just let it wash over you. What I mean by that is consciousness itself, existence itself, existence itself could be a kind of life form, an ever existing life form. And the world that we see of beginning and ends is a world that it generated as super intelligent, ever existing life form generated not just this reality, but everything as a counter balance to eternal existence. Everything in this reality is balanced, but that balance feels imposed. And if I was a super intelligent entity that had always existed, I would create a world just like this because as I've said in past episodes, do go check them out. Eternity is long as fuck. <laughs> eternity is a very long time. A super intelligence would get bored, right? There was an episode it's titled because gods get bored. 
Another episode I, or I spoke about of podcast is that what if earth is another world's heaven? If you are a god, or goddess, more likely a goddess, if we're being honest, because that's where life comes from, it's female. Anyway, if you're a goddess, right? And you've always existed and not in the physical form that we perceive, it's just an ever existing everything. Like the entirety of all existence is this entity. I can't conceptualize it from within whatever this is, but the entirety of existence is this entity. Now, if you were, oh, you've always existed, then to counter that, right? If you are an ordered intelligence, you would create a world that was like, that moved to its entropy. You would create this chaotic world that we have to balance this ordered immortal life that you've always had, right? This would be the balance. This would be the imposition, right? A world where everything dies is would have to be the counter for a world where nothing can die, where an entity, right? A one soul entity that cannot die would create a world where everything dies. A one ordered world, the balance, what is the balance to that? The balance to a single everlasting entity would be a world that's fractured and dies but they're the same as I knocked my microphone. <laughs> they're the same, right? They're the same. Yin and yang, shadow and form, dark, light, black, white, exist simultaneously as one thing in a state of balance. The balance is always imposed. What have I said? The balance is always imposed. As I'm talking right now, I think about what's going on in Maui, the people of Maui. Please guys go on Twitter and actually look to see what people are saying and the people of Maui are reporting. There's lots of videos out there. Please go and look. It's not what we're being told. What breaks my heart is that that is the world there. Like Hawaii is beautiful. It's literally heaven. It's paradise on earth, but there is this underlying sort of undercurrent of like darkness, right? Where this is happening. People are having their homes taking from them. And these people have been quietly, like trying, they're not quietly, they've been trying to get the message out. And it's like, so we're not aware, you know? Like it's just people aren't being made aware in the ways that people have been programmed to be made aware because the mainstream media isn't talking about it. People don't know. It's not like people don't want to know. But if you're programmed to only get your information from one source of information, then people don't know. So these people aren't being heard and what's going on there is fucked up. There are people who their homes have just burned down, whole neighborhoods of children gone. People died in their home. They're not discussing this and their homes have just been burned down and they have realtors calling them, offering to buy their homes for penny on the dollar, pennies on the dollar, days after they've lost everything. Disgusting. When these sort of things happen, I can, it's really really easy to get sort of overwhelmed by this sort of feeling of like, this is like fucked up and just feeling absolutely devastated. What I can say to counter that is you guys remember that you don't have to do everything by yourself. Just make others aware because everyone doing what they can to help, even if it's just a little bit. If I get everybody in this country to donate a dollar, I will become a millionaire overnight because there's 300 million people, just $1. Do you see the power of a group of people doing a small thing, right? Think about like a business subscription service, right? Netflix, talk about they're not making any money. They're making money. They're just spending more money than they're making. But if everybody's paying $5 and you get millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people, thousand people that you see doing something small that makes a difference. Keep your ear out. Keep your eyes open, help in the way you can get others to help. You know, before I realized what was going on there, I talked to my partner about buying property there. I'm not going to, I don't even know if I will go on vacation there anymore. I was there just this summer. I love it there, but I'm not going to feed the beast. I'm not, I, 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 I love it there. 
but I'm not going to feed the beast. Instead, I'm going to keep an ear out and an eye out for opportunities because right now they're blocking, as of the time of this recording, they're blocking people from being able to help unless it's through like the Red Cross or FEMA, which do your research on that. Um, they're stopping people like regular people from being able to help. And I, that's just, it is what it is, right? But for now, do what you can. You know what I mean? Do what you can. If this has come across your path, then you're supposed to do something about it, but you don't have to do everything. Do what you can, tell a friend. Do what you can, tell your friend. That's it. We're all in this together, right? All alone. That's the one ever existing entity from which all of this flows. All alone, all one. All alone, all one. Yin and yang. Right. Thanks for listening.